on Sunday morning for really going to like, what did Jesus say? What are the questions that we come to with Jesus and what was the answer? So can I, I will pray to get us started. We're just diving right in this morning. So join me. Um, God, we just give you thanks, Father, for all the ways that you are at work, all the ways that you are moving. God, so I just thank you for everyone that's here this morning. Uh, we believe that you've gathered us um, specifically for this moment, but just, so I just pray that you're there to teach us, um, change our hearts and our minds. Just kind of like that. We speak Shannon. Um, yeah, God, she just uh, listen to your to your words, God, and just express it to us, and we'll be just here in a little moment. So we love you. Amen. 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 So, summer <laughs> so far is in Good 
life choices. One of these people goes to church, one of these people doesn't. And yet, despite these differences, they are both going to encounter Jesus, and Jesus is going to say to both of them, you both have the exact same problem. And I'm going to offer you the solution to that problem. So before we jump in, I know Corey just prayed, but I need to ask the Lord to come and speak through me. So if you will quickly bow your heads, I'm going to lead us in prayer. Holy God, we thank you for the beauty of this day, of a new day of life, that we woke up this morning and we drew breath and that you have chosen to let us live. Lord, come in to this room this morning, open the hearts of all of these students, and just pour your word into it. Lord, just pour me out as your vessel. May it not be my words, O oh God, but your words. And may you make these two lives relevant, meaningful, and life-changing to the people in this room. Plant your seed, burrow deep in the hearts, so that it bears fruit all the days of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So normally, for those of you who don't know me, I always bring a PowerPoint. Um, however, the queue is having technical difficulties. <laughs> So that's probably more sad for the teacher and me than it is for the audience and you. But So I'm just going to have to tell you the scriptures this morning. But our two stories come out of the book of John. The first one is in the third chapter of John. The second one is in the fourth chapter. And I'm going to try to move through them very quickly so I don't bore you to death. So third chapter of John. We're going to start with the rich man who's respected and really a pretty good person. The scripture introduces them this way. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus at night. And he said, Rabbi, we know you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So this man, Nicodemus, we know from this passage that he's a Pharisee. The Pharisee was a religious leader of the day, and they were very, very serious about God's law. And they like to make sure that everybody obeyed God's law. And they sort of added traditions of their own to God's law that they considered law. For example, on the Sabbath day, you didn't work. That was part of God's law. So they added some things to it about what work was. And they said, well, carrying food is work. So you're breaking the law if you carry food. So they would meticulously measure their food so that it weighed less than a dried fig. So they weren't breaking the law. And this is how the Pharisees were. They were always coming to these minute details and sort of adding traditions to it of what they considered to be the law. Nicodemus, as a Pharisee, would have been educated. He was probably wealthy. And it says here that he was a ruler of the Jews, which means he was a member of the Sanhedrin. That was like a judge. So it was an elite group of men who are very powerful, and he's one of these men. So, what we know about Nicodemus is his life is pretty good. He's living the ancient dream. He's kind of got it all. And yet, here he is, this religious man who's supposed to know everything there is to know about God, and he comes to Jesus, albeit secretly at night, and he's got questions. He's very confused. And I think that there's a message to us in that. There are those of you in this room who were maybe raised in the church. You may know all the right answers, and even if you don't know, you know if you holler out Jesus, you're going to get close. But you don't know what to do beyond that. Or maybe there are those of you in this room that think, well, as long as I come to church, and as long as I am a good person, then whatever comes after I die is going to be okay. And there's a lot of people that believe that. That as long as you're good, that's all that matters. And that was really where Nicodemus was. I think he was simply coming to Jesus to find out, have I been good enough to have eternal life? He's secretly sneaking here thinking, I am a member of the Sanhedrin. I am powerful. I have it all. I just want to make sure, this guy Jesus, that if he is God, that he's going to tell me, yeah, you're going to heaven. And so this is how Jesus responds to him. He says, I say to you, 
unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So really what Jesus said is, no, Nicodemus, you're wrong. You are not good enough to go to heaven. Now, Nicodemus is a little stunned, and he comes back at Jesus, and he says, well, so if I have to be born again, what does this mean? Do I have to get back into my mother's womb? And how does a grown man do that? And when we read the scripture, sometimes we can't tell tone. So I don't know if Nicodemus was being sarcastic or if he's um, sort of exasperated, like maybe Jesus really is crazy. He just said, I gotta be born again. Okay, maybe he really is a nut job. We, we can't read tone, but all we do know is that Nicodemus is taking Jesus very literally and thinking that he's got to get back inside of his mom and be reborn, which of course we know sounds silly. And Jesus responds to that. He says, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So, let me explain that. Jesus is saying, I'm not talking about a physical rebirth. You're not going to be physically reborn. What I'm talking about is a spiritual rebirth. You see, the Pharisees were stuck on flesh. And for them, the flesh was rules and this idea of religion. And Jesus is standing here saying to him, it has nothing to do with your flesh. It has nothing to do with the rules, and it has nothing to do with your religion. In fact, Jesus says, it is about being born in the Spirit. And what that means is, it's not just knowledge. It is a change in your heart, because God literally takes up residence inside of you. That's what happens when you become a Christian. God literally puts himself inside of you. Now, of course, he's absolutely blown Nicodemus' mind. And he just says to Jesus, what are you talking about? How can this be? And Jesus comes right back at him, and he says, well, you're a teacher of Israel. Why don't you understand these things? So Jesus isn't very gentle with him. He's like, you are a leader. You are a teacher, and I'm telling you, what you should already know because it's been prophesied for years. And in fact, hundreds of years before this moment, Isaiah had said, all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags to God. So Nicodemus should have already known he's never going to be good enough. And Jesus calls him out on it. But Jesus goes on to say, we speak of what we know, and we testify of what we've seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you of earthly things, you don't believe me. So why will you believe me if I tell you about heavenly things? And really what Jesus is saying to him right here is, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you that you have to be born of the Spirit, but you don't like what I'm saying. You see, all of our knowledge about God will not get us into heaven. You see, not you, not me, not Nicodemus can it ever be good enough for heaven. But that's why Jesus came, because he knows that. The scripture says, for it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. It is not anything that you do, it is a gift from God. And it is not by works, so no man can go. So Jesus is standing there telling him not to make him feel bad, but to make him understand why the world needs a Savior. And essentially, some of the most famous words in the Bible come during this conversation. Because Jesus does call him out. He isn't very gentle with him. And he's brutally honest with him. But he offers the solution to Nicodemus's problem. He says, God so loves you that he sent me into the world to save you so that you can have eternal life. And God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn us, 
but to save us. Now, to be born again is a God thing. And um, Jesus wants Nicodemus, and he wants us to know that we are loved. And he knows we're not good enough. That's what he's for. He's to make us good enough. It's not what we do, but it's what the cross does. So now we're going to shift gears to the woman, and then we're going to compare them back how they're similar. And we're going to be in the fourth chapter of John now, and in the seventh verse. It says, There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no, no dealings with Samaritans. So let me unpack this quickly for you. A Samaritan, does anybody know what a Samaritan was? Okay, kind of, kind of. Anybody else know what sets a Samaritan apart from a Jew? All right, well, I'm going to teach you something now then. So the Samaritans and the Jews hate one another. And in fact, it's a grudge they've held over each other for five centuries when this story takes place. So that's a lot of years of hatred towards another people. And the hatred is rooted in the fact that five centuries earlier, some of the Jewish people were conquered and put in exile. And then their conquerors intermarried with them and had other children. And so it became a mixed race. They would be half Jew and half whoever their conquerors were. And at one time, that was the Assyrians. And so the Samaritans were considered mixed blood. And the Jews didn't like them because they were of mixed blood. And then it made the Samaritans mad that the Jews didn't like them, so they didn't like them back. And so for five centuries, this hatred has grown. And what makes it interesting is, I, I couldn't bring a map this morning, but if this is land up and down. So you have Judea, which is kind of where Jerusalem is. And then you have the land of Samaria, and they don't like each other, and they're right next to each other. And then right above that is Galilee, which is where Nazareth is. So you have two Jewish places and a Samaritan place in between. And these people don't like each other. So when the Jews have to get from Judea up to Galilee, they won't go through Samaria, which is the simplest route. They would avoid it at all costs. And the Samaritans didn't want them to go through them. In fact, if they came through Samaria, they would purposely not feed them or offer them shelter because they didn't want Jews coming through their land. So the Jews literally had to go this way east across the Jordan River and then back up. All over a centuries old grudge. But look at Jesus. In this story, when we see Jesus, he didn't go across the Jordan River and up. He went straight through. And he's in the land of Samaria. And that's a lesson in and of itself, that Jesus is always doing what no one else does. So here is Jesus in a land where he is not welcome, and where other Jews say he shouldn't be. And he's tired, and he's sitting by a well, and a woman comes along. Now there's a problem with this woman. And we know this because the scripture tells us she came at noon. You didn't draw water at noon. It's hot. Water's heavy. You put it in big clay pots. It's work to get down in the well. It's work to carry the pot back to town. And women were never alone. That was not done. Women came in the morning, and they came in the evening, and they did it in groups because that's what, what culture dictated, and it was kind of a social event. So here you have this woman coming all by herself at the wrong time of day, which tells us she's not welcome with the other, with the other women. We don't know yet why, but there's a problem here. And what does Jesus do? He asks her for a drink of water, and she's stunned by this. And she even says to Jesus, I'm a Samaritan. Gentlemen, if you spoke to a girl back then, you would have to marry her. You did not break those societal rules. Jesus was totally breaking society's rules by even speaking to this woman who was all by herself. You didn't do it. And if you did do it, you might be married to them. But you think that bothers Jesus. Of course not. So, 
I mean, I think that's one of the things I love when I kind of thought through and prayed through this story because Jesus doesn't care that she's a woman. He doesn't care about her race. He doesn't care about society's customs. He doesn't care that they have religious differences. All Jesus cares about is this woman. Everything else is thrown out the window. Now, it's a little ironic that she is focusing on the law, and he is. But Jesus says to her, in fact, he ignores the fact, her question altogether. And, she sa and he says to her, if you knew who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have said back to him, and he would have given you living water. Now, she's a little confused by this, and she says back to Jesus, she says, well, this is a deep well, and you don't have anything to draw water out. So where are you going to get this living water? So he's obviously piqued her interest, but she's being very literal. She thinks living water is real water. And so Jesus says back to her, everyone who drinks of this water in the well will get thirsty again. You're right. But whoever drinks of the water that I give you will never thirst. For that water will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. So, he offers her water that will permanently satisfy her thirst, which is salvation. Now, of course, she doesn't get that yet. Jesus has shifted the conversation from the physical realm of stating a physical need of thirst to the eternal realm talking about salvation. And this is an important story because this conversation that goes on between Jesus and this woman is the longest one-on-one -on -one conversation recorded with Jesus in the Bible. So the longest conversation Jesus has with any person one-on-one -on -one happens with a Samaritan And I just think that's so interesting because, and it's such a lesson to us that Christianity is not just for Christians. You know, and Christianity isn't for those who we perceive in us. You know, Jesus went where the religious people of the day wouldn't go. And Jesus spoke to the people of the day that their own friends, their own neighbors wouldn't speak to them. And there's an example in that. So she says to him, so eternal water, living water. She says, well, where do I get this? I don't want to be thirsty. I don't want to come back here and draw water again. So she's interested, but she's still very literal, and she's only thinking about herself. She's like, I want this water so I don't ever have to come back to the well again. <coughs> Sometimes we do that with God. If we're in a situation we're like, okay, I'm going to pray to God because I'm sick, or my mom's sick, or I've lost my keys, or I need to do well on a test. And so we turn to God, and we're like, God, I need this from you right now. But then we're done with it after that. And that's kind of how she is at the moment. She's like, okay, I'll take it because you're giving me an immediate need right now. But she's not really necessarily interested long term yet. And Jesus never won to shy away from anything, cuts really straight to the heart. And he says to her, go and call your husband. And she answers him, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says back to her, you're right, you don't have a husband. In fact, you've had five husbands, and the man you're living with right now isn't your husband at all. Now that's a little painful to hear from a total stranger. You know, Jesus literally dove right into her conscience. And he pulled a veil back on the sin that was in her life. And when we encounter God, that happens to us too. Because as I told you this morning, whether you believe it or not, you are a sinner. I am a sinner. There are things in our lives that we do that we don't want other people to see because we know they're wrong. And Jesus just said her sin. Wow. It was a little painful to hear. 
So she answered. She said, well, he must be a prophet. Because of course, there's no way he should know that about her. She said, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. I know that there's a Messiah coming. They call him the Christ. When he comes, he'll, he'll declare things to us. So really what she's done, at least the way I interpreted this, is she changed the subject. You know, it got a little too personal, so she shifted the conversation kind of back to more um, impersonal religious things. You know, we do that today. We don't mind talking about religion or debating religion as long as it doesn't get. And we're seeing that played out in hundreds of ways in our culture right now. As long as your religion doesn't tell me how to live, it's fine with me. As long as your religion doesn't tell me what's going on in my life is wrong, you can have it. But the second you say something to someone that points out that there's something wrong in their life, you hit a nerve. And people are like, no, 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 I don't have anything to do with that. We've gotten to the point a lot of times where we think, if I think it's right, if I feel like it's right, well, then it's right. That must be true. And we have to be careful to not be deceived into thinking that what we feel and what we think is right. That's what the scripture is for. The scripture is not a bunch of rules. It is a lifestyle. And it is there to tell us what is right. And the reason we obey it is because God wrote it and God is perfect. Aren't. There's no way we're going to know all the right answers because we are in faith. And that's what the scripture is for. So Jesus says back to her. He says, I am the Messiah. And that's the first time in the scripture that Jesus tells anyone openly that he is the Savior of the world. And he tells it to a woman tells it to a Samaritan. You see, Nicodemus was focused on the rules, not on God, and he thought himself above sin. And he needed to understand that he was a sinner in order to receive grace. This woman knew she was living immorally, even if it was by the world's immoral standards. And Jesus was showing her that she still had worth and value. Jesus found her worthy of that declaration, the most important declaration, despite her bankrupt life. You see, Nicodemus and this woman have the most important thing in common, and that is that they are loved by God, and that he came to save them from their And apart from Christ, all of us are sin. That's what the blood of Jesus is for. So how do they respond to Jesus' honesty in their lives? Well, the scripture tells us that the woman actually dropped her pot and ran back to town and told of everything that happened. And it's so interested the townspeople that the Samaritans did things that they have never done before. They asked Jesus to come and eat and sleep in their town. And he did. And it says that many people came to know Christ. Nicodemus, Jesus would be arrested in the 19th chapter of John. And Nicodemus would be the only Pharisee to stand up and defend Jesus. And then when Jesus dies on the cross, it would be Nicodemus who would bring myrrh and aloe and fine linens. And he would be the one who would wrap Jesus' body from the tomb. You see, the message here today is that we should never think more highly of ourselves than we should. And we should never think we're so bad that we're unworthy of salvation. The solution to what's wrong with the world is as easy as the problem. And that is Jesus. 